Hey guys, so today we're gonna to be talking about textures and oil paintings, how the masters used it, how you can use it to apply it to your own work, work, how certain effects change your artwork, what's good, what's not. It'll be fun, I hope you enjoy yourself. Anyway, let me get right into it. So first when I was painting, I didn't find a lot of information on YouTube. I found that there wasn't really a lot of videos on painting texture, and that was odd to me, so I assumed that it was not as important as other aspects of art. But I slowly found through my own experience that texture really does affect the way that your paintings look from far away in the whole way that, it is, that it's experienced. So I'm going to give you a few anecdotes from my own work real quick so you can understand that a little more concretely. So when I first started painting, I made this painting of the cat and it had this, this ambiance and this kind of effect to it. And I, it's almost like I didn't really earn the ability to do that because I had no idea how I did it. And because of that, I wasn't able to reproduce it in successive artworks. So I knew that I had this sort of feeling to it, but I wasn't sure what sort of artistic techniques I was using to actually accomplish it. So what happened is that I was knocking my head against this painting for like a year and a half, trying to figure out what worked, what didn't, how I got the certain effect. And I was going through all these different reasons. And eventually I found that it was paint texture and color. Um, surprisingly because color usually isn't the problem but color was actually an influential part of this but mostly the painting texture depending on the effect that you want for paint your painting you want to change your technique and you know what you're trying to actually do i would suggest if you want to get a very ala prima very silky kind of wet into wet thick paint sergeant kind of style and i'll show you an example of sergeant's work and what it looks like up close and front or far away if you want to have that freshness to it then we want to use is you want to use a lot of paint and then sometimes a lot of medium. You gotta be careful with the medium though, because if you use too much medium, then it starts like dripping down the painting. And when you have drippy paint, you just used way too much medium. So you have to be really careful with that. Don't use too much medium. The thicker the paint, generally the more fluid it's gonna look, the more sergeant it's gonna look. And that's gonna give it this kind of, not really like plastic, but it's gonna look almost like glass. Like the paint is gonna have this kind of glassy feeling to it. And some people really like that. And you know, it's it's for some people, and I, I think it's important in some parts of the artwork to have that, but I don't necessarily think that you should have an entire painting that looks a little prima. Because when you have a variety of anything in art, it, things look better, right? So if you have all the same value, it looks bad. All the same color, it looks generally bad. You know, uh, the world around us is extremely various and there's a lot of intricacies and differences and there's nuances to everything that we see out in nature, in daily life, the experiences that we have. And art's really no different. When you're only limiting yourself to one texture, one color, one whatever, one technique, you're really bottlenecking your potential in art. So I think with the textures, you're gonna to wanna to use a variety of different textural techniques to, to actually accomplish a good work of art. So the different texture techniques are the smooth fluid technique that I just talked about with Sargent. And the way to do that again is with a lot of paint and then some medium if you want. So any medium could be like linseed oil, it could be safflower oil, you could use a bunch of different stuff. Um, obviously don't use the, the thin, like don't use paint thinner mineral spirits to make it look more fluidy. It won't make it look more fluidy because it'll it'll dry up. It'll just look thin. Uh, so yeah, so don't use that medium, but use general like oils and stuff that will make it look a lot more fluid. So when would you wanna use that kind of texture? You'd wanna use that kind of texture in skin, very fair skin. So if you're painting like a woman or something, you might want to use more, more body and medium to your paint because that's going to make all the shapes much cleaner. And when you have clean shapes, it, it's going to make the skin look more clean. You know, it's kind of like you're photoshopping a person in a sense. You're you're getting rid of their defects. So, <clears throat> simulated texture is texture on the painting, but it's not physically there in three dimensions. So I can show you some up close artwork that has this effect where it's basically dry brushing. That's what simulated texture is. So you put in a wet layer and then you wait for it to dry and then you put on just very lightly a bit of paint, just grabbing a little bit of paint and then just dryly kind of brushing it over the top of the surface. And what happens is that when you're putting on the paint, some particles stick and some particles don't of the paint, right? So some of the old painting is showing through, but some of the new paint is still there, right? And what that ca causes is on a, on a macro scale if you looked in it'd be this very like you know polka dotty kind of look but when you back up it averages out the tone and you can see that there's a little bit more detail there that's not actually there so i'm going to show up the painting that i was referring to earlier about my cat painting right it looks like the cushion here has a lot of 
detail on it. When in reality, it doesn't really have that much detail on it. It's all just simulated texture. I went in there, the painting only took me about two days and I just kind of brushed it in real quick and it was very dry white paint. And what that did is that it made it very, very detailed. And it was a simulation of detail without actually having to put in any detail, you know? So when you'd want to do that is on certain fabrics. So you can see that Velasquez in uh, Las Menas or whatever that painting was on the girl in the middle, he used this technique where it was like really dry brushed white. And what that did is that it made it look like fabric because fabric is obviously has a lot of fibers and stuff. And that he uses a lot of simulated texture there. So <clears throat> you're going to want to use it in fabrics. You're going to want to use it in, you can use it in anything that has a lot of variance to it. So a concrete wall, like a brick wall or something where there's a lot of like speckles of stone, you know, anything like that, you can use some stim simulated texture. You should always strive for simplified shapes though, because once you make your shapes too complex with texture, you can really start losing the essence of the image. So you can notice that in any great art, artist work, Sargent, Roya, uh, Frazetta, anything, they have really clean shapes. Now, when you add on texture, it doesn't necessarily make the, the shape less clean. It can actually make it more clean because if you have a lot of complexity and you cover it up with a sheet of texture, then it can unify the shape and it, make it makes it a little bit more simpler. But you need to make sure that one of the downfalls of texture is if you do it in a patchy way. You don't want to do it in a patchy way. If you have a value shape, then you want to cover the entire thing with the texture. Anyway, so <clears throat> the other thing besides simulated texture is actual texture. So actual texture is just three-dimensional texture. I'm sure you've seen paintings on Instagram, any of social media in museums where they use really impasto paint. And what impasto paint is just really thick paint. And it's so thick that it goes from the 2D illusionary perspective and it's actually jutting out at the, at the viewer. And what that does is that it casts actual shadows on the physical paint itself. So you're not simulating a shadow with a darker value. You're actually, you have the light shining down on the paint. And then what that does is that it creates physical shadows on the surface of the painting. And that can also simulate textures. So you gotta be careful with this one in particular because simulated textures are gonna look generally the same in all kind of lighting because the whole painting is gonna have an even sense of lighting on it because the surface is, isn't warped, right? But when you add on a lot of actual texture to the painting, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the lighting that you want is the museum kind of quality lighting. Dramix Paint talks about this a lot. You wanna paint in the lighting that you are gonna eventually display the work. Because if you painted it with, let's say light coming from the right, right, like on my face right now, say I'm the painting or whatever, then you have like a nose, which could be the simulated texture and there's all these like bumps and like shadows and stuff. And you'll paint it in such a way that it looks good in that specific kind of lighting. And then when you take it into a different kind of lighting, then the piece looks like complete crap. And you really want to avoid that, right? So be careful with, don't use too, too thick of painting, of paint, unless you're doing it in really good quality lighting. <clears throat> now, another thing with texture is how it actually influences style. So we talked a little bit about how Sargent used very fluid paint and that, you know, that represented his very shape kind of oriented style how his style looked very fresh it looked new it looked wet like it was actual wet paint even under varnish but you can also you can take it a variety of different ways so you, you can talk about artists like named Abbott Thayer and that guy used crazy amount of texture and his textures are really interesting so he'll have some all prima kind of stuff and I'll show like the vase that he did and that, that used a lot of impasto paint but then also he'll use very dry brush kind of techniques and that gives it a sort of air to it an atmosphere to it because it, it loosens up the edges and he he was a crazy guy actually he would put like mud and grass in his paintings all this crazy stuff to achieve this these weird textures his work is really interesting because it feels like there's like something subtly off about it but anyway so he, he would use if you want to learn about textures and the variety of textures you can use and you know how it affects your viewers perception of your work then I would definitely suggest looking at his artwork. But what he would always do is that he would use very soft peripheral dry brushing, generally speaking, around the, the peripheral elements of the composition around the subject. And then he'd use harsher edges, really, around the eyes and around the faces and the subject. You'll find that in a lot of paintings that what painters often do is that they loosen up the edges and the peripheral elements of the painting. And what that does is that it clarifies what the point of the painting is. And it's usually the subject which has the harder edges. 
So texture kind of plays a role in there. So if you're using a lot of dry brushing around the peripheral elements of the painting, it's gonna feel a lot more atmospheric and it's also gonna draw your viewer's attention towards the face. So he's another example of how you can use texture to influence your style. His style is very earthy, it feels very real. It feels very detailed, even though it's not. I would suggest going and looking at his pieces in person, I did. It was it was a very crazy experience. Uh, he stood out above a lot of all the other painters that I saw. I went up to DC and I saw a sergeant exhibit when I was up there, but I also saw his some of his paintings. And it was so crazy that it would look like a hand from back up, and Drum Mix Paint talks about this as well. It looked like a hand from back up, and when you got close to it, it was just so crazy abstract. And he was really good at doing that, and he was really good at imbuing texture into his painting. Another way that you can go about it is like the Philip DeLaszlo route. Now, DeLaszlo was similar to Sargent in the sense of mass painting technique and really his subject matter, which was portraits. But what he did is that he would always use a lot more medium than Sargent did. And when you add a lot of medium, it actually does thin the paint. And it thins the paint because it makes it flow more. So you're using less paint per square inch. You could think about it that way, like on the painting. What that does is that it kind of thins it out. And when you're thinning out the paint using a lot of medium, what happens is you get like a really smooth, glassy texture. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And then also you get the underpainting really showing through a lot. So what you can do with that is that if you have a wash for your underpainting, like with really thin mineral experience or whatever, you use really saturated colors on your underpainting. And then you use a lot of medium over the co over the top of that with you know your background color or whatever. Then what happens is that you see a lot of the saturation of the underpainting showing through and that adds a really interesting dynamic but that's that's a texture but it's not the texture that you think about right because you think about texture as something that's textural but another texture would just be something with no texture right something really smooth and his stuff always looked really glassy almost like everything in the painting was porcelain right and this is where a texture is a really really de big determining factor in your style because you can tell what something is when something is by DeLazo versus when something is by Sargent, almost solely based on their texture. Now, there's obviously like subject matter differences, saturation differences, but it really does have a large, very large effect. So, another thing you can do with texture, and this is more of a technique based thing, is that you can create a sense of ambiance. So, if we go back to the painting that I was talking about earlier with the cat, the reason why it has this this body to it and this kind of this awe to it is because there's a lot of escaping values coming off of the light portion. So if you have a light portion and you have a dark portion, like, you know, the, the background behind the chair, and then you have like the, the chair, the ottoman sort of thing, and it's really bright. And then you also have a softened edge between those. It's going to look like the light is escaping off of the object. So if you think about light rays as just little beams, then a beam goes and it hits a surface and then it bounces off, right? And when there's a lot of beams bouncing off, then it gets trapped into the atmospheric particles around the object, and it lightens up the, the values around the object. And what that does is that it makes something look like it's glowing. And what you can do is that it's really hard to make something look like it's glowing all the prima. You can do it, but it takes a lot of subtle halftones where you're grabbing the, the dark and then the light, and then you're putting in a halftone, and you're putting another halftone between that, and then you're trying to make this gradient. It's a lot easier and it looks a lot better. It looks more detailed, in fact, when it's not. It's almost like getting detail, but you're not grabbing the viewer's attention. And on top of that, it also doesn't take a lot of work. It's a really effective technique. What you can do is that you can grab a dry brush of something that's between the tone of the really dark background and the really light you know, object or whatever. And what you can do is use a lot of texture and then you can just lightly kind of put it in. And what that does is that it gives it that sense of ambience. So hopefully, you learned a little bit about style, techniques, just texture in general. It's a, it's a big topic. I certainly haven't figured out everything yet, but I hope to. It, it's really something quite important that not a lot of people talk about. And I know I talked a lot about how it affects oil paintings, but this goes way deeper than just oil paintings. This is There's drawing textures, there's you know pastel textures, and a lot of the time that the medium that you're using determines the texture that you have. But that's one of the good things about oil painting is that it's very variable. So anyway, I hope you guys learned something. Uh, I hope you guys have a great day. All the best and go make something beautiful.